The sea is calm tonight. The tide is full. The moon lies fair upon the straits. On the French coast, the light gleams and is gone. The cliffs of England stand, glimmering and vast, out in the tranquil bay. Come to the window, sweet is the night air. Only from the long line of spray where the sea meets the moon-blanched land, listen, you hear the grating roar of pebbles which the waves draw back and fling at their return. Up the high strand, begin and cease, and then again begin with tremulous cadence slow, and bring the eternal note of sadness in. Sophocles long ago heard it on the Aegean, and have brought into his mind the turbid ebb and flow of human misery. We find also in the sound a thought, hearing it by this distant northern sea. The sea of faith was once too at the full, and round earth's shore lay like the folds of a bright girdle furled. But now I only hear its melancholy, long, withdrawing roar, retreating to the breath of the night wind, down the vast edges drear and naked shingles of the world. Ah, love, let us be true to one another. For the world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams, so various, so beautiful, so new, hath really neither joy, nor love, nor light, nor certitude, nor peace, nor help for pain. And we are here as on a darkling plain swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight, where ignorant armies clash by night. Now, we have just heard a poem recited in its original language. One of the goals of poetry is to create a kind of music out of pure language. The sounds of the words themselves invoke images. When I say the word sea, you can hear in my hissing the sound of water. When I say calm, you hear my tongue slowing down the movement of my mouth so that I have to close it gently. When I say full, my mouth has to create a shape that provides maximum resonance for my voice. When I say fair, my mouth comes close to smiling and opens in a welcoming manner. And the word straits is particularly wonderful because it means a narrow passage connecting two large bodies of water. So there are those hissing S's again framing the word on either side, straits. And all of this helps create this image in an almost cinematic way. The sea is calm tonight. The tide is full. The moon lies fair upon the straits. That's so beautiful just as it is. So why would you need to add music? That's a fair question. It's commonly said that great poetry rarely makes great lyrics and that the best lyrics are there to serve the music and don't necessarily stand on their own. But of course, that's just an observation, not a rule. And there have been great lyrics that have stood on their own, as well as poetry that has been set so masterfully to music that it creates an artistic synergy that seems fully integrated to the point where you can't think of the words without the music or vice versa. In the case of Samuel Barber's setting of Dover Beach, it doesn't create that kind of synergy, but it's not trying to. It's more of a commentary on the poem, a dialogue between two eras and cultures that highlight the multiplicity of meanings of Arnold's images and the changing tides of history and attitudes toward religion that occurred between the writing of the poem and this musical setting. Arnold was 29 when he wrote this poem in 1851, and Barber was 21 when he composed the setting of it 80 years later in 1931, while a student at Curtis Institute in Philadelphia. <clears throat> Barber was born in 1910, so by the time he became conscious of the world, he became conscious of war. By the time he first encountered this poem in his teens, the images of the lights of the French coast and the cliffs of England were associated with the movements of troops during the Great War, World War I. And by 1931, he may very well have had a premonition that an even bigger and more brutal war involving those same straits was on the horizon. So as Barber set this poem to music, he brought with it an extra layer of 20th century anxieties and meanings. And yet, he still stuck close to the imagery in the poem itself. The first image in the poem is a calm sea, 
but of course even a calm sea is constantly moving, and Barber imitates the moving of gentle waves with a violin, with a violin oscillating between two strings. Let's hear the beginning of Barber's setting of Dover Beach. images of a moonlit sea, but in its uneasy harmony, you also hear Barber's anxiety that the peace could be disturbed at any minute by forces that did not exist 80 years before. And then later on, he raises the stakes with the setting of the line that begins, listen. So you see what I mean about how this setting is kind of a, a commentary upon the poem. The image I have of this setting is of someone nervously muttering this poem while watching newsreels of British naval forces preparing for war. As the kids say today, the effect is meta. It's aware of its own artifice. Barber wasn't the only one engaging in that kind of meta perspective in the early 1930s. So were Kurt Weill and Bertolt Brecht, and they had a similar impulse in seeing the past through the lens of the present and implicating the audience in creating the tension between the desire to engage with art and entertainment while dealing with an unavoidable reality, as if you're not only acknowledging the elephant in the room but giving it a role in the play. But what's interesting is that Arnold himself, 80 years earlier, was himself a bit Brechtian, a bit meta. Look at that second stanza when all of a sudden he stops painting a picture of nature and starts talking about Sophocles. At that moment, he stops engaging directly with our senses and starts talking to us as students of history. Well, Barber, taking his lead, does this too. Barber was fascinated with the music of Claudio Monteverdi, was a pioneer in the way that music could enhance the emotional affect of a text. Monteverdi was the first great opera composer, and the impulse that created opera among a community of Italian artists of the late 16th century was to evoke how they thought ancient Greek drama, like Sophocles, was presented. That it wasn't just spoken, but declaimed in a heightened version of speech that was a hybrid of song and oration. What those Italians came up with was what we now call recitative. So it makes perfect sense that where Arnold evokes, evokes Sophocles, Barber evokes Monteverdi.
faith, Barber relies on a kind of cliché of liturgical music, you know, thumb, dee, 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 a cadential figure that can also evoke the turning of the earth since it seems to roll back on itself. So it works to illustrate the most abstract image in the poem, one that's perhaps more polemic than poetic. Where Arnold is just getting on his soapbox about the erosion of religion, Barber picks a, paints a picture of spiritual confusion in this brief passage that gets us much closer to the heart of the matter. And then he elaborates on that figure, connecting the dots between spiritual faith and faith in love. But now I only of the poem contains its most famous lines. And you can imagine someone like Verdi giving us a loud graphic vision of those ignorant armies clashing. But what Barber does instead is something that Arnold does not do, and many critics of the poem think he should have done, which is to return us to the sea, the one constant primal force that will outlast human folly. <laughs> 